welcome you to C1 Church. If you have not been with us or you are a guest or maybe you have not filled out a Connect card, um, we would love for you to fill out a Connect card. And then um, there is just some offering boxes just directly as you are going out of the door off to your right. There is a, a little gray box and you can put it in there or you can come and hand it to one of the staff members. And we would love to talk with you, meet you, and just say we are so glad that you are with us this morning. Um, we just want to to welcome you here to C1 and to just let you know that that we have been in a ser- series of the past few weeks of just who we are. And that and very quickly we are we is, C1 Church exists to celebrate Jesus to live in community, to share our story, and to make a difference. That's why we as a church exist. And so um, we just want you to know that first and foremost. So if you're like, man, I don't know what this church really believes. Well, we believe that Jesus is first and foremost in our lives and that we are going to celebrate him, that we're going to live in community, we're going to share our story and make a difference. And one of the ways that we can make a difference is through giving. It's part of being obedient and you have three options to give with us. You can give with either cash or a physical check in the boxes that Amy talked about on the sides of the doors. Or you can text your amount to 84321. And if you have a specific fund you'd like to give to, include that in your message. Or you can give online at our website at c1.church. And we're just excited to have everybody here today. We're excited to continue to be able to meet in person. And part of that is all of us continuing to follow our guidelines. And we thank you so much for your cooperation and your participation. And we hope to continue to be able to meet in person. And uh, we just we thank you guys so much for your giving and being faithful to the church and being faithful to the church in, in many ways and praying for us and, and praying for one another and your giving and everything. You are making a difference, and that is one of our core values is to make a difference. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are so good. God, we thank you that, that you are so faithful. And Lord, we thank you here today and that, that your word says that where two or more are gathered, you are there, Lord, and there's more than two people here, so we, you are here. So, God, I pray that you would change our hearts and our minds and that we would focus in on you, that when we, that when we leave, that you would be the center of everything we say and do and that you would, would change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, I pray. amen. Let's pray and worship. On the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break, his broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Open up the gates, so open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow before him 
How many believe that today? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? There is no one. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow before him stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleasing that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers. For and why, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. Who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. If you believe that, would you sing that out today? You are perfect in all of your ways. Oh, you're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. I don't know who you are today, uh, but maybe you're here and you sing a line like that and you say, uh, if I was going to be honest, I'd be lying to say that that I believe that. 
maybe you're in the midst of something and you're thinking, how in the world could a good God allow this? And I just want to encourage you today to not let your circumstances shape your theology. And I'm guilty of that, I've got to, I've got to admit. But we need to let the opposite happen. Our knowledge of who God is shape our circumstances. And uh, at the end of the day, you and I, we're, we're sealed in time. We don't get to stand outside of it like God and see start to finish. And uh, whatever you're going through probably doesn't make sense right now. And it might not on this side of eternity. But what we do know is that God is good. So I don't know who who needed that today. I want to encourage you. We're going to sing that, that, that line again. And even if you feel like, you know what, I'm lying if I'm going to sing this because I just don't believe it right now. It's not what I'm experiencing. Uh, Sometimes, sometimes you just need to speak out the truth of who God is or what his word says is true, even if you don't believe it. And we're going to do that. We're just going to declare that right now. Oh, not going to let my circumstance shape who you are. No matter what I'm going through, even if it doesn't make sense, oh, I trust you. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am, even if I don't feel like you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways and to us oh even when it doesn't make sense you are perfect in all of your ways oh you're perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to trust you Lord even when I don't see it even when I don't feel it I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. But you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, 
nothing is better than you I'm not afraid to show you my weakness my failures and flaws Lord you've seen them all and you still call me friend the God of the mountain is the God of the valley and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you oh there's nothing oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn mourning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you're the only one who nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you oh I've searched and found oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you you turn graves into garden you turn graves into garden you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can you're the only one who can you're the only you're the only one who can I can't help when I sing about what my God can do, what he has done. I can't help but think about there is nothing impossible when God is involved. There there are people in this room that have gotten bad news just this week. There are people in this room that have might have gotten impossible news and they don't know how to deal with this week. But I can tell you this, that God, when he enters the equation, that it doesn't matter what you're going through. God is greater 
than your situation. God is greater than your diagnosis. God is greater than what you are seeing. Jesus. Jesus. Father, I thank you that everything on this earth and in the heavens is subject to you. I thank you that there is not one authority that has more authority than you. And Father, I pray right now that you show up supernaturally. Lord, you turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You're the only one who can. You turn seas into highways. Some of us need to, to see you make a highway out of a sea right now. I pray right, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you will that you will show yourself faithful because you are. That's not that's not you might be. You are faithful. That's who you are. I thank you, God, for what you've done just in our hearts today. It, the, the realignment, the refocus back on who you are in the midst of a world that's, that's shoveling out fear like it's currency, that, that's shoveling out propaganda like it's whatever. Lord, you remind us and you realign us to who you are. Father, I pray that as we transition into a time of worship in your word, from a time of worship through song, that you continue to work in our hearts. That today we walk out of here thinking about how we can make a difference, about how we can push forward and advance the kingdom. Let there be a spark in some of us. Let this be a launching pad. Let this be a push. Let this be reinvigorating for those who are. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. If you don't know, my name's Ryan. I think 99% of you might know that already. Uh, but as you can see that we're doing things a little different today. We are continuing in our series called C1 Church. And what we're doing is we're going through, we're going through our core components of our strategy. So our mission here at C1 Church, make no mistake, our agenda is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. We're not trying to pull a bluff over anyone's uh, eyes. We're not trying to disguise it. We are loud and proud about it. We want to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, this side of eternity, that's the only thing that matters in life. So our strategy for leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ is celebrate Jesus. Number one, if he's never done anything for us, if he never took the cross for us, guess what? He's still worthy of worship because he's God Almighty and we're creation. But he did take the cross for us. He did make a way when there was no way, and we're going to celebrate him. We're going to celebrate him not just here on a Sunday morning, and corporately together. We're going to celebrate him, man, when we stub our toe. We're going to celebrate him when we don't feel like it because he's worthy. I, I actually just had a conversation this week, and there was a person that said, I just don't feel like I'm close to God. And I said, good news, good news. Our relationship with Jesus isn't based on our feelings. So whether you feel like it or not, we do it. And then we live in community. We live in community. We, sh we bear one another's burdens. We, 
we, we, we come together. How we exercise community um, as a corporate body is through life groups. Life groups. We want people plugged in, studying the Bible together, bearing one another. We, we do it through life groups. And then we share our story. We, we share the gospel. We share where our story and, the, and Jesus' cross intersected. And we, we, we share that because every one of us, were in that moment in our life, it changed the course of our life. And we need to share that. That's what we're commanded to. And today, we're going to make a difference. In making a difference, we're going to do things a little different. I don't know if you notice this tall, strapping young man up here next to me, but um, we're, we're going to take and try to approach this in a team effort. And uh, Nathan, do you, do you, do you want to, to add anything to this introduction? No, but uh, if you thought you were getting out of here a little early today because Ryan's only doing part of it, ask our wives on how it, what it's like to leave church early. It doesn't really happen very well. We both like to talk, so it's going to be kind of like a southern goodbye. We're going to start by saying goodbye in the house. We're going to go to the driveway, talk for another 20 minutes. And guys, we're going to sit in the car with the car window down and talk for another 30 minutes. Yeah. So we'll be out the door later. Let's just start by saying, um, in closing, and uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Thursday we went over this, and both of our phones were like, bzz, 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 bzz. and I text James like, I'm, I'm heading home. And then an hour later, she calls me, and I'm still out here talking to Nathan in the parking lot. So, um, but we're, we're, uh, we're, we're going to be looking in Mark chapter 6 today, and it's kind of interesting how we came to um, this section of scripture, because I've been wanting Nathan to get into the preaching rotation um, for a while now, and I think I asked him at the end of last year um, if he would be willing. I said, hey, pray about it, and he's like, I'll chew on it. Um, it's more like one of them, eh, well, let's talk about it later. <laughs> yeah, and, but then COVID happened, and uh, he, pray, he had a lot, long time to pray about it, and he said, I, I want in. I, I want to be a part of that. And I said, okay, well, that's awesome. So we started thinking about where, where we could work together. And I, I remember my first time preaching on a Sunday morning. Um, I was asked to preach in my home church growing up. I, I think I was a, a junior in college at the time. And uh, I was just kind of thrown to the wolves. Just FYI, church people from this angle are scary. So... Um, um, not that any of you guys are, uh, but uh, I was just thrown to the wolves, and I was like, I don't want ever anyone on our staff that has never done that. I don't want that to happen, and so we, we started thinking. I was like, you know what? I think make a difference will be it, and so we started praying about what to speak and everything. We knew that we were going to be talking about make a difference, and I, I kind of, I, I wanted to talk about Dorcas this morning out of the book of Acts and how Peter went and resurrected her and everything. And the more I read it, I was like, this will fit. But I'm like, no, I can't preach it. It just didn't feel right. So I, I went to Mark chapter 6. Well, our first meeting a couple weeks ago, um, Nathan came in. He's like, I have some notes down. And um, this is what I prayed about. And the Lord led him to John chapter 6. And what's crazy about it is like I... Honestly, I was kind of stuck. I couldn't really figure out anything, where to go, whatever. And Emily, you can actually thank Emily for this one because, thank God, I have a wonderful woman of God on my side because, um, yeah, I was kind of stuck in Scripture. I didn't really know where to go. And she kind of led me to uh, John 6, I believe. And, uh, and we, we started praying over it, looking over it, and uh, that's kind of where I, I felt like I need, we needed to go, and then I brought it in. And yeah. lo and behold, he's just in a different book with the same story. Yeah, it's the same narrative. It's the feeding of the 5,000 men, and I thought, if that's not the Holy Spirit, God's about to do something this morning. So I just, I just need everyone to, this is why I tell Sky, like, Sky, are your listening ears on? She goes, turn them on. Turn those listening ears on, because God's going to speak to you this morning. God's going to challenge us this morning. I, I want to set the tone for what God's going to do, because I, I, I can't help when, when the Lord leads us to the same narrative that he's about to say something. And it's going to be great. So let's just jump in 
We're going to be reading Mark, and we'll probably throughout the throughout the talk today be pulling in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's a little bit because there's different elements from each of them. This is the only miracle apart from the resurrection of Christ listed in all four Gospels, and I think I've told you guys that before, but if all four Gospels came at it, there's something that we need to learn here. And so let's go ahead and start. We're going to be looking at 30 through 44. And it says, The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry and told him all they had done and taught. So Jesus sent out the the 12, and he gave them authority to cast out demons, preach the gospel, heal the sick. And they did that for a week. And that's what's going on. Let, and then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. Because he, he understood something. Ministry is exhausting. It really is. Because you're constantly walking by faith. You're constantly pushing worry aside. You're constantly saying, okay, God, what do you want? Holy Spirit, where are you leading me? And if you look at how he sent them out, he said, don't take extra money. Take a staff. Just take a cloak. Well, let's go. He's like, don't even take food. Like, just trust the Lord to provide for everything. That's how they went and did ministry. And he said, because of this, there were so many people. Uh, I got ahead of myself. I'm from Arkansas, so um, reading is not my strong suit. I'm joking. Stop it, Ryan. Um, then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. Get this, alone. Go off by themselves. They were crowded. They literally got on a boat to get away. I want us to understand that. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. That tells me one important thing. People back in Jesus' day was way better shaped than we are today. They ran ahead of a boat sailing across the sea and beat them there. Um, that's insane. I've been riding my bike lately. I could barely walk right now. So um, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he said, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion on them. So he began teaching them many things. Matthew's account tells us that he got down and healed their sick, healed all their sick. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. With what? They asked. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh... It's kind of interesting that they, they wanted to do that. They, they obviously wanted to be alone. But I, I think it's interesting how if you look at Christ's response and the apostles' response, there's a difference. But the apostles turn it around here in a second, and it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be really neat to see what happens. We have... We have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. Um, we, John's gospel tells us it would be half a year's wages. If you put that in today's term, the average income for the United States right now is about $60,000. So $30,000 would it cost to feed that many people just, just to give them a bite, just to give them a, just a bite of food, not even a full meal, $30,000. And uh, many scholars believe that there's 15,000 people here because we'll see here in a second, but it, it says 5,000 men and their families. And on average, according um, to historians, that the average family back in Jesus' day, there wasn't just one kid. There is usually two to three kids. They had big families, like two, two plus kids, because that was that's how they set their inheritance up. They just had more children. And... Um, but a, a, a conservative estimate of how many people were present is 15,000 at least. 
Um, I, I heard this week alone, I heard that there could have been 25,000 people present. I mean, let's think about that. That's like Titan Stadium. I mean, what does that hold? 30,000? 25,000? It's like 40. 40? Like so, I mean, that's a, lot, that's a large number of people. How much bread do you have? He asked. Go and find out. They came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. Then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up to heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves, then breaking the loaves, sometimes we want the blessing without the breaking. Um, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted, and after, afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers of bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. So we look at this narrative and... There's a lot going on here. If you've been in church for a week, you've probably heard this story. If you haven't been in church, you've probably heard this story. It's one of the best known stories. In fact, if you guys want to follow along, the color sheets in, in the seats in front of you are of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And No one's going to take me up on it. There's crayons too, so I'm just joking. Uh, but th there is some key things to making a difference because you're like, how, is this, how are we going to tie this into making a difference? Well, I, I think there's some key components into making a difference, and we just want to give you two thoughts today. We figured since there's two of us that like to talk, we better not push the envelope with three thoughts. But the first thought we want to give you is we make a difference by making ourselves available. And Nathan, you, you actually kind of have a, a beautiful narrative in your life, actually, about what it looks like to make yourself available and the difference that can make. Do you, do you care to share a little bit about that? Yeah, because um, honestly, I've been to this church for, for quite some time now. I mean, I probably annoyed a lot of y'all running around as a little kid at some point in time. But... Um, if you asked me five years ago, or even, even four years ago, you never caught me dead up here on the stage, right? I'm an engineer. I don't do people. I don't talk. I like me, granted, I love to talk to people, but I don't like to talk in front of people. So not really part of it. Like I'm an engineer. I do numbers. But so like, it's like getting, going back to it. This all came about because I made myself available one time. And it just, I thought it was just for a moment, and, you know, God has greater plans for all of us. Because often, what we see a lot of times is we all want to see a difference made in people, right? I mean, we all want to see somebody change for the better. We all want to see, I can, I can keep naming off all the cliches of all the differences we want to see. But we don't want to be the cause of that difference. We don't want to see the difference made because we stepped out and made us, or gave some extra time to it. So, I mean, it's honestly just like the disciples right here. We're, we're really not that far off from the disciples. They really cared about the people. They really did. They wanted to care about the people. They, they cared so much, like, hey, send them away so they can go get food. But they didn't actually want to do it themselves. We, we're just like that. We often want to care for the people. We, we care about them. We want them to be saved. But what do we do? But send them to that there. They, they can take care of it, right? That's the, that's the easy thing. I mean, but to be honest, this is probably like the easiest thing we can do to make an impact in God's kingdom, just availability. We're already living on borrowed time. Jesus breathed his life into us and gave us the time that we have on this earth. So we're, li we're living on God's time. At least we could do is sh share a little bit about it. Five minutes out of our time, I mean, how many of us waste five minutes, I mean, just piddling around doing something that doesn't matter? I mean, five minutes can make a difference. It doesn't have to be done. I mean... So often, 
I could tell you so many ways. I could tell you so many ways of uh, you know what's it look like, you know, how you can make yourself available, what you can do. But I mean, I would be doing you a disservice. I could tell you, you uh, wipe off your chest, spin three times, you know, spit on the ground. All right, you may, then, you, then you go do this, right? No, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work for it. <laughs> but um, the reason why is because God has a unique plan for each and every one of us. It, we're uniquely designed, and we're uniquely placed in this earth at the time we are for a reason. And like I said, it doesn't have to be some elaborate thing. So like, um, it's just like here, Jesus, if you, if, you, if you want to look back at it, Jesus didn't necessarily want to do this miracle at this time. If you really read the scripture, Jesus, is, yeah, he, he wanted to take care of people, wanted to make a difference, but he's also fully man, right? He's trying to go mourn the loss of his cousin, John the Baptist. If you read, if you read into it, John the Baptist had just got killed. He just got executed. That was his cousin, so he wanted to mourn. And they just also they, they all just got back from like doing a lot of ministry work and a lot of, and a lot of travel. So they were tired, physically tired. But they seized an opportunity. There was people there that were running after them. Like Ryan said, I can't outrun a boat. These people did. They obviously were hungry for something. And it wasn't just food in their bellies. The food the, the food is just a miracle that, that happened within the story. So but sometimes just making ourselves available is, can be as simple as listening. Like I said, it's the easiest thing we can do to make ourselves, avail- make ourselves useful for God. It's just listening to somebody. You know, my favorite, go out to eat with somebody. I mean, I like to eat. A lot of people like to eat. You know, it's a good time to sit there and talk and get to know somebody. And you don't have to be, like, the most well-versed person. You don't have to know, be able to quote scripture left and right. It's, it's pretty simple. I mean, it also, volunteering in the church, you don't have to. You don't have to have just a little bit of time. That's it's. You have no idea what you, what you are doing and what kind of impact it makes on others. Volunteering in a life group is another example, or leading a life group. I mean, I know it's not it's not for everybody, but and I, and I'm just naming off a few things because the opportunity for us to make ourselves available is going to manifest in a different way for each and every one of us. Like I said before, Jesus and God had a has a unique plan for you. It might be five seconds, it might be five minutes, it might be 20 years. I can't tell you when it's going to happen. That's only you. And a lot, and a lot of times, we, we miss our opportunity. We, we sit back and we miss it, and we, allow God, and we allow God to pass and don't seize the moment. So, like, but it's not... That hard, and most of we don't realize that we that we missed it when it happens. So I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start a little bit like um, often you you never like I said you never know if, what you can do for somebody. Sharing your story, and we're gonna go. I'm gonna go back to like a couple a couple sermons ago. Where Ryan was talking about it, sharing your story. Um, that's probably like the easiest one of the easiest ways for us to to make ourselves available. We all have a story. We're all equipped to do this. Like. We are equipped with everything we need to make ourselves available for God. We have a story, we're breathing, and we all have a form of communication, whether it be a text message, our words, or just our time. I mean, sometimes your actions speak louder than words, too. And I'm, like I said, I'm not, a big, I'm not a great speaker, so sometimes I, I, I work. That's my way of doing it. But your story and your testimony may be exactly the spark that you need to start the fire in somebody that the fires went out long ago. Or it's ready, or it's ready to be lit. It's sitting there, it's waiting. It just needs that one spark. One spark starts a fire, and the fire burning in somebody can do great things. So, if you don't mind, I want to share my story just a little bit more in depth, um, real quick. So, how I kind of came to be be a youth pastor here isn't the most conventional way. I didn't go to Bible school. You know, as you know, I went to UT Knoxville. Go Vols. Um, <laughs> I, like I said, went to UT Knoxville. I did, it was not Bible school. I was an engineering major. I majored in mechanical engineering and have a minor in aerospace engineering. Nothing about that entails scripture. Right? I didn't learn scripture in class. But that's not saying I can't do it. I have a different story and I have a different mode of thinking is all. 
You see, what happened was, is like, we had a different youth pastor at the time, and I, you know, I was kind of, I was asked, hey man, you want to, you want to, you know, help with the youth some? <laughs> to be honest, my, I know you what you're thinking, oh yeah, I'll do it. No, I could look at it and I said, <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> talk to me later. <laughs> and went on about my business. Didn't, totally laughed it off, kind of told it not, it wasn't for me. The fellow was annoying. He asked me again the next week, and then the next week. And finally I said, you know what, I'll give it a shot. I'll do it one time, and, I was, and in my head I was going, I'm just going to tell him I'll do it. I'll show up, do it one time, tell him, you know, it's not for me. This is not my thing. You know, and at that point in time, who could blame me? But I did, and then for some crazy reason, I kept showing up. I kept helping. And I ended up leading Bible studies with the youth to help lead some stuff and, pl- and plan some of the events. And I had, a lot of, I had a lot of fun. And what I didn't realize the entire time, God had a greater plan for me. And I ended up learning more from the situation than I, than I probably taught. But it, it's crazy how God works in that time. You know, it turned like, <laughs> yeah, not for me, guys, um, into, okay, 6.30 Wednesday, you'll be here. Um, so, like, again, going back into it, further down the road, like I said, we had, we had some staff changes, and that, and that included in the, in the youth department. They left our youth without any youth leadership at the time. And um, I'm going to kind of stop right there just to say they hit the pause button and set the scene just a little bit, kind of how this all started. Okay, so Emma and I, we were in Jamaica on our honeymoon, tropical island, waves crashing below, you know, all the fun stuff. Honeymoon, too. Um, we, were, <laughs> we were honestly getting ready for dinner that night. We had a reservation on the, on the resort we were going. We were, we had, we had dinner planned, and I can't remember if it was the first or second night. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Uh, well, I, I was sitting in the bed waiting on her to get ready. She was putting her makeup on and whatnot. And thank God I'm a guy, and I, and I can get ready in about five seconds. Because I was sitting there just listening to the waves because the beach is my happy place. And um, I, know what you're, I know what you're thinking. This is an absolutely horrible place for God to intervene in my life. Why would God interrupt me on my honeymoon in Jamaica with the waves crashing below? Terrible location, right? I mean... Um, but to be honest, it was the exact last location I expected to have an interaction with God. I expected to enjoy my honeymoon with my new wife. I just had a lot of life changes going on and not think anything about church or anything that was going on. So I, like I said, Emily was getting ready and I kind of, I kind of, I rolled over, looked her direction. I said, um, I think when we get back, I need to start a Bible study back for the youth There's something. Because it had been a couple weeks, been two or three weeks since we since had a meeting. Like I said, we didn't have a youth pastor at the time. It was just kind of in the middle of some transitions and some major things happened. And nobody honestly could have blamed me if I if I said, you know, I, I can't handle this right now. It's not for me. But it wasn't right. There was, there was something kind of stirring deep in me. I just couldn't, I couldn't let it not happen. And this was my opportunity. So then I did the next stupid thing. Other than, you know all that stuff with, on the beach, you know. I texted my dad on my honeymoon. Let me sink in real quick. I texted my father on my honeymoon. Don't do that. <laughs> but the reason I did that, my dad was on the board at the time, so, and, it was a lot of, and I couldn't just say, hey, I'm doing a Bible study. I'm going I'm to start, start youth back without the board's approval at the time. So I went in and texted him. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a long, drawn-out conversation. It was, hey, uh, when we get back, go ahead, go ahead this Sunday when we're gone, uh, announce that uh, we're going to start youth back the, next, the following week. I mean, there's no backing out of it once, you know, they kind of announce it in the middle of service. So I was tied in then. <laughs> so we went ahead and buckled up, and uh, like I said, honeymoon in Jamaica, texted my dad. Also, this God decided to speak with me. You know how rude interrupt me on my honeymoon. But... Um, <laughs> But God in that room had placed a stirring on my heart that we, we couldn't give up. We needed to keep going. And I, I didn't know if it was like for next, if it was for a couple months or if it was for a week, maybe two weeks. I didn't know. You know, I didn't know what the plans were when we, with the new pastors that we got on. So we didn't know who we were getting quite yet. And thank God we got the pastors that we have. I mean, I, we're tr- I'm truly blessed to get to serve alongside them. And I'm blessed that they, that they wanted me to stay on. 
Honestly, I just wish all of God's stirrings and, uh, you know, guides would have happened on a tropical island because I'd never leave. <laughs> It'd be fantastic. But going back to it, that's my story. And like I said, it's not, not everybody has, this, has the exact same story. Making ourselves available to the, is the simplest form of submission that we can have for God. And it's, and it's an exciting thing. I mean, it's unnerving at times to make ourselves available. It's uncomfortable. It's not what we want to do always. I mean, some of us, we just got off from work, and do, I don't want to go and spend 15, 20 minutes talking to this guy in the parking lot. I mean, really? Guys, I just worked 12 hours. I just worked eight hours. I just worked in 150-degree heat, 110-degree heat, whatever the plant was that day. I mean, it's hot sometimes where I work. Last thing I want to do some days when I get off is talk to people. But, I mean, then again, you can ask my wife. He's, she'll probably say, yeah, he says that, and then we go somewhere, and he just keeps talking. And he doesn't shut up. I, I think I've heard that once twice as, as he doesn't stop talking. How, where, where did the words come from? I mean, <laughs> but like I said, in James 4, we're told, some, we're told to submit ourselves to the Lord and resist the devil. And later in the same chapter, and same chapter, we're told to humble ourselves before God and he will lift us up. That means God has given us everything that we absolutely need to share our story or to make ourselves available. And there's no reason why we should be scared. There's no reason why we shouldn't do it. And like I said, your availability may just be listening to somebody for five minutes. I don't know. I'm not going to tell you what yours is going to be. It's going to be different, and it's going to be useful to God, even whether you see it useful or not. See, the, the devil, he's kind of a sneaky dude running around. He's a very sneaky fella. I mean, he has changed our entire culture to cut out us wanting to be available. Our entire culture has changed. We're a very me culture, right? Right? It's all about me. It's all about number one. How many of us have heard in shows, people, you know what? Me first, and then you can have some, right? I'm going to go first. My turn. I mean, we turn, we've often turned, because of our culture change, we have turned, on our, turned to ourselves more than we have made ourselves available to others. I mean, Let's be realistic. How many, I mean, how many times do I say, you know, I'd rather watch this TV show. My TV show comes at 6.30 on Wednesday night. Jesus is at the door going, hey, come here. Yeah, um, this crazy guy's at the door. Let me turn the volume up. You know what? It doesn't work that way, right? Uh, Jesus, Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, open the door and I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. You have to open the door. Simple. But we often say, waiting for God to use me. I'm here. I'm waiting. Jesus, just come on in. He's, he's waiting for you to open the door. He's at the door. He's yelling your name. Nathan, I need you. I, I'm probably sitting here on the couch going, ah, leave. Let me go to a different room. I can still hear him. And that, we, all, we all do that. We're not, it's not just me. We're, we're all guilty of it. We move on. He's calling to us. But it takes us to submit and open the door. Often, we want to be used, but it has to be on our schedule, on our convenience. Not at 6.30 p.m. when our show's on. Not 7 to 5 when we're at work. Not when I'm on vacation. You know what? At the grocery store, go ahead and just put that behind me, too. Let's go ahead and crack that out. Um, in the car, I'm doing more, more things than I need to do. I don't need to call somebody. That We have so many excuses. We have so many excuses that we make for ourselves. But... The reason we should make ourselves available is because it kind of fulfills the Great Commission, whether you're going overseas or you're staying here or you even call yourself a missionary. We're all on the mission field every day. There are people who have never heard Jesus that live next door to you, go to your school, have never had it, heard, heard it in a presentable manner. And we're equipped to do it. We have a story. God has interacted with us, each individual, in our own ways. So... Biggest thing I had, I had to do is tell myself, it's not about me. It's not about Nathan Tosh. Let's be realistic here. It's not about Ryan Tatham either. It's not about any, any of us. I mean, 
It's about a maddening driver that's driving down the road 10 miles an hour below the speed limit, and you're just trying to get from point A to point B because you decided to leave work for 10 minutes, leave, leave from your house to go to work 10 minutes late that day, and you're so mad you're ready to cuss the guy in front of you, right? Don't look at me like that. Like that. We've all been there. We've all done it. Road rage is real. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm guilty. Um, <laughs> Like that one person that walks up to your desk or wherever you're at and instantly it's like, oh my goodness, why are they here? Stop talking to me. And they haven't even said a word yet, right? Yeah, God, it's, it's about them too. God has a plan for them too. And I'm probably that guy to some of you because uh, you've, I've wandered around, run, through, run, run between y'all when I was little and everything else. And you're probably like, why is this kid talking to me still? He won't go away. It's been 20 years. <laughs> I mean, but let's be realistic. It's about everybody. It's about the, chair, the empty chairs around you, too. There's somebody that belongs in the empty chair that is spoken for by God that is not here right now. It's about a lot of people. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about them and how we get to them. So, granted, for me, it's about you. Definitely, don't get it wrong. It's about you for me. And it's about them out there, too. But... It's not about me. That's the biggest thing I tell myself every day because so often I want to go into work and go, oh, it's Nathan's day. And then, you know, everything breaks. Um, <laughs> but so often we, we make a difference. The biggest way we make a difference is by making ourselves available, but we can't make a difference if we're too busy making excuses for ourselves. Like I said, I can count, I can go through excuse after excuse after excuse on why I can't. But if we change to why we can't to why shouldn't we, you won't find an excuse for why you shouldn't. Hmm. So when, when you're uh, on your honeymoon and everything, and uh, you feel that prompting of the Holy Spirit to uh, start a Bible study up for the youth, would you have called being a student pastor no. No, no. Uh, would you have said, okay, if I do this one day, I'm going to get to speak on a Sunday morning to this church? That was the last thing that crossed my mind. Yeah. And then you uh, text your dad, and that solidified everything. And what, what's interesting is uh, when we make ourselves available, we don't know the end goal of God, if that, ma if that makes sense to you. So Nathan was just thinking Bible study, but God had a completely different plan along the way. And then when I came on board in March of 2019, Nathan and I had a conversation. And do you, do you recall what you said to me? Yeah, I remember you said something. You asked, you're kind of like, kind of, like, uh, I don't know the wording for it, probing kind of to see where I was at with it, what I was mm -hmm. doing, kind of how I felt with it. And I'm pretty sure I told Ryan something to the effect of, you know what, I'll do this as long as you need me, but when, when you're ready to move on, that's okay. You can move on, and I'll just find something better to do, or something, not something better to do, but something else to do that'll help. Yeah, and, and when he said that, in the back of my head was, I'm not going to let him get away, because he's going to find a way to serve, no matter where it's at. It, if it's not youth, he's going to find a way to serve. And I, I love that heart there. And the, um, th that was our first closing. Our second closing, um, no. no, but we make a difference by making ourselves available. Now, Nathan and Emily, not only, um, obviously, this, this year has been completely insane. It's an unprecedented year. So we're trying to think of unprecedented things to do and move forward and everything. Uh, but now they're, they're not just student pastors. They, they, they have so many skills and, and uh, anointing upon them, and they, they are affecting. Because we, as a lead pastor, I look at things as a team. Ben and Ashley, they're part of the team. Amy and I are part of the team. Nathan and Emily, we're a part of this team, and we move forward together. And I, I can't tell you how blessed that I am to have Nathan and Emily on this team. And 
the fact that there, there's so much more than just student pastors. And that's the cool thing about making ourselves available and how that ties into making a difference. Because they're not just making a difference in the, the, the students, but they're making a difference in your life. They're making a difference in how this church is operating because we're a team and they have ideas. They're, the Lord has just, he knows what he's doing in placing people right where he does. And I can't help but think that there are people in here that if you just step out and say, okay, God, I'm available. What a year from now might look like. And that ties right into our second thought for today. We make a difference by making ourselves obedient. And not only did Nathan and Emily, they made themselves available. They said, okay, I can do this. But then they texted Randy on their honeymoon and said, do it. They were obedient to that. And we step right back into Mark. And I, I want to I set the scene for this miracle that Jesus is about to do. Because here's the thing. This miracle would have never happened if the disciples were not obedient. Did Jesus need the disciples to do the miracle? Absolutely not. He didn't need them. He doesn't need any of us. He's God. He chooses to use us in our availability. They made themselves available. Even though they didn't necessarily want to do it God's way. I want you to hear this. The disciples did not want to do it God's way. And there are times in our life where we don't want to do it God's way. In fact, if you read um, the different narratives, you'll see that they came up to Jesus. And in fact, it was in Mark, he said, uh, they said, Jesus, it's getting late. Send the people away. And Nathan hit on it. They wanted to take care of the people without taking care of the people. They, they cared, but they didn't care enough to do something themselves. They wanted the problem out of their hands. That was their solution. That was their, um, hey, this is my recommendation to how to do this. Jesus, this is how we do it. Jesus asked a question in the Gospel of John. He asked Philip, who is actually from this region, he says, um, how, how much would it cost to, to feed all these people? Because John tells us Jesus already knew what he was going to do. God already knows what he wants to do through your life. He does. But Philip comes back and said, we would have to work for half a year just to give someone a bite. But that's not what Jesus asked, was it? Philip, once again, is answering a question that Jesus didn't ask. Jesus asked, how much would it cost, or where, where can we get food? And, and Philip responds with the answer that Jesus doesn't need. And so they made their objections known to God. This is my thought, God. This is how I think we should handle this situation. Send the people away. But Jesus says, that won't be necessary. You feed them. He puts the burden back upon their availability. They were tired. Yeah, some of us are tired. Some of us feel like we served our time. Some of us feel like we, we've, we've already volunteered in church. It's time for, you know what I'm saying? But he said, no, 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 you, you feed them. You make yourself available. And then... Jesus takes and he, he, he asks them. What, what's interesting is when Jesus said that statement, they start answering questions that Jesus never asked. And I think we do that same thing in our walk with God. Jesus, God will tell us to do something I imagine when you started feeling that in your heart in Jamaica, you started answering questions that God didn't ask. It was probably like, Nathan, I want you to, you, you lead the Bible study 
but God, I don't, I don't have a uh, Bible degree, you know, stuff. Uh, did, did you have that stuff going through your mind? Oh yeah, countless, I did. countless things. Like, you know, I had every excuse in the book. It was, yeah. uh, this can't be God right now. I'm, I'm in, I'm in Jamaica. God doesn't talk to people in Jamaica right now. Yeah, no. I mean, <laughs> yeah, God, God doesn't talk to people on their honeymoon. No, actually, He does. It's called your wife. Um, the Holy Spirit sounds a lot like wives, uh, but. What's interesting, though, is we do that. God will tell us to do something, but then we start answering questions. Well, God didn't say, um, how are we going to do this? How much money is it going to cost? How many, like, he said, no, you feed them, and they're like, well, it's going to cost this much money. Uh, Jesus, we don't have enough food. We, we, like, they start answering questions that he never asked. You lead a life group. Jesus, I, I, I don't have the space in my house to lead a life group. That's not, what he, that's not what he said. He didn't ask, do you have the space to lead a life group? He said, you lead a life group. If you trust him, he'll work out the details. Or you, 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 you go talk to that person. Jesus, I don't even know him. He didn't ask if you knew him. He told you to go talk to him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's a difference. And so often we hear this instruction that somehow between our ears and our brain it becomes a question and we give an answer. Which is called being human. My daughter does that all the time. This guy, pick up your toys, but I didn't get them out. Well, that's not what I asked. I told you to pick them up. But I didn't get them out. <laughs> Jesus, I need you right now. Darling, I'm telling you to pick up your toys, because if I pick them up, I'm throwing them away. You know, I'm, I'm not that mean. My parents did it to me, by golly. I'm going to do it to my kids. No, that's just called good parenting. No, I, I actually don't know whether it is or not. I might just be emotionally scarring my children. I, I don't know. Um, I seem to have made it, uh, but... We answer questions Jesus didn't ask, but when we make when we, we can make a difference though if we make our, if we make ourselves obedient. Because the disciples had an option. They had an option whether they wanted to do what Jesus said to do. Because if we get caught up on answering questions that Jesus never asked, we will miss the significance of the questions that he does ask. We will miss the questions that he asked us if we get so caught up on the things that he's telling us to do when we're trying to think of excuses of why we can't do them. What does he ask them? They say, I, we, we have these loaves and fish. He asks them, bring them to me. That is a very significant question. He's asking them to bring them to him. And the reason why is because it's enough for God to work. He's not asking you to bring what's in your neighbor's hand. He's not asking you to, to bring the qualifications of that person. In fact, Nathan and I had this conversation earlier because um, we were talking about um, delivery and just talking about, you know, because he... Um, to your own admission, you've never done this. No, <laughs> not and at all. so we were talking about this, and I, I said something to the extent, I said, Nathan, God's anointed you to be Nathan Tosh. And he's not wanting you to be me or Ben. He's wanting you to be Nathan Tosh. He's wanting you to bring what you have in your hand to him. And it's, it, it, it's so fitting. We so often look at, what someone else has, and say, well, I can't bring that to God, so I better not bring anything to God. Or I can't do it all, so I shouldn't do anything at all. That's the dumbest thing you could think. You're not dumb. You're smart. But it's stupid to think that. Just because I can't do it all doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything. That's so dumb. Just because you can't do it all doesn't mean you shouldn't try to do something. And, and Jesus asks them to bring what was in their hands. He said, just bring it to me. It didn't seem that significant. If you, if you notice, 
that um, it's a little boy's lunch. It's a snackable. You guys with grandkids, you know what a snackable is. Come on. And he says, bring it to me. And what, what's so cool about that is what you have in God's hands is more than enough to accomplish what he told you to do. I don't know what God, I, I'm, I'm praying that the Lord lays things on your heart to do. There are things in this church that need to be done. We're, the staff together were working on, on some things to help plug people in. We, we need that as a church. God doesn't need anything. But at the same time, there's a blessing in serving. We make a difference when we make ourselves ob obedient. The, the disciples had a choice. Well, are we going to bring what seems so insignificant to Jesus and see what he does? Or are we just going to just chill and be okay with what the status quo is? We could just all be hungry together. Some scholars believe that some of the people have not ate for three days. They were following Jesus that much. We, 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 could, we could chill and be okay with the status quo and be hungry together and, and, sat, and, and, and settle for insignificance and settle for stuff. When, but when God just says, you feed them, he knew what he was going to do according to John already. And, and he says, you bring what you have in your hands to me. It's going to be more than enough. It's going to be more than enough. He asks him to do that. And what does he do? He blesses it. He blesses it. He prays over it. Pray over it. Then he breaks it. Allow God to break it. Because the multiplication in this miracle does not happen without the breaking. Anytime God wants to use you, there needs to be a brokenness. He doesn't have time for pride. In fact, he's the, James says he opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. Then it says if we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, he will lift us up in honor. There's a brokenness that has to happen. But in that brokenness, we'll, we'll, we'll see that, you know what? God's gonna, God is enough. And that he's going to use us. And I'm going to make myself obedient, even though I made my objections known. It's not that God doesn't want to hear him. He heard the disciples' objections. He heard them. But it didn't change the fact that he wanted them to do it. And then he, he said, what you have in your hands is enough. Bring what you have to me. Bring what you have to me. He blesses it, and he breaks it. And then he multiplies it. And I want you to notice where the miracle happened. Think about it. Seven loaves and two fish. So, or five loaves and two fish, sorry. Uh, there's 12 disciples. So you five, let's just say he broke each loaf in half. Well, that takes care of 10 disciples. And then he broke the two fish in half. Or he might have just broke one fish in half and handed it to one of them. And he just ate one by himself. I don't know. Uh, but he had enough just by breaking the pieces in half to give each disciple a piece. But as they were obedient to what Jesus initially told them to do, you feed them, multiplication happened. The miracle happened. I can't tell you... I, I truly believe there are miracles and blessings wrapped up that have never come to fruition because people were not obedient to the instruction. Countless. Oh, that's not for me, God. I can't do it. God, I'm an engineer. I'm an engineer. I can't, I can't like, I don't have a seminary degree. I don't know anything. I, I, I can't do this. But God, God's like, no, 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 no. You lead them. You feed them. And as the disciples went out, guess what? They did not individually give 15 to 25,000 people food. Logistically, they would have been there for a week going, oh, here you go, here you go, here you go, here you go. Like, 
that just doesn't make sense. They were sitting down in groups of 50. They probably said, hey, here, pass that around. Hey, here, pass that around. They were giving pieces of food to people, and it was multiplying in the hands of the people, and it was multiplying in their hands. The miracle of multiplication didn't happen in Jesus' hands. It happened in the obedient hands of the apostles, and then it went to the people. We're waiting for God to do all these miracles, and God's just waiting for our obedience. And I, 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 I just want us, I truly, we, we're, we're going to celebrate Jesus. We're going to live in community. We're going to share our story. But we got to make a difference. It's not enough just to celebrate here on a Sunday morning. We got to celebrate all the time. And when people see you celebrating in hardship, when people see you celebrating through mourning, when people see you celebrating Jesus, it's going to make a difference. When you live in community, when you invite people to your life group, when you're going out of your way to be the community of Christ to people that aren't part of this church, you're going to make a difference. When you share your story, when the Lord says, go talk to that person, well, Jesus is COVID-19 and they have a mask. I have a mask. Well, guess what? You can still hear. You can still talk. It might be muffled. It might be more like this, but it's fine. It's good. It's good. Go talk. Just because COVID-19 is going on doesn't negate your responsibility to share your story and make a difference. Well, my health, God. They're eternity, people. Sorry. I get passionate about this. There are some things that we just got to make ourselves obedient to. Make ourselves. The, the apostles made themselves obedient. They pushed themselves. I'm not saying that we're unwise. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying just be obedient. The, the Lord's not going to lead you where he's not going to keep you. And you know what? Even if it doesn't happen... Paul says to live as Christ to die is gain. <laughs> we, can't, we can't lose for winning in this life with Jesus. It's just win, 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 win all day long. So if you're going to take a bets, bet on Jesus. But when we share our story, we make a difference. And when we say, how can I serve this local body? We make a difference. Because it transcends me. Nathan hit on it. It's not about me. We make ourselves available. We have to make ourselves available. That means, you know what? I might not get to do what I want because my availability. I, guess what? You only have 24 hours in a day. I only have 24 hours in a day. We each only have seven days a week. We each only have 52 weeks a year. We have a limited amount of availability. So what, what I would challenge you to do is to prioritize making yourself available for God and make yourself obedient to the availability that he tells you to do and then see God do crazy things. To see God bless not just you and your family, but bless people around you. The disciples made themselves available. They made themselves obedient despite their objections. 15 to 20,000 people ate till they were satisfied. Their availability and their obedience made a difference in 15 to 20,000 people's lives. And I can't help but think, that was just 12 of them. That's just 12, 12 apostles. Yeah, I mean, Nathan, how many students have you spoke to? I mean, like, probably dozens upon dozens since that one since that one time. And it's going to turn into hundreds upon hundreds. Thousands upon thousands. But there's no telling where it will lead as we do it. And guys, imagine if 12 people made themselves available. They, they made their objections. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But at the end, they made themselves obedient. Imagine what a church full of people can do. Imagine the difference that we can make in our families, in our neighborhoods, 
in our jobs, if you're retired, in your family, <laughs> in this church, in this community, imagine. It doesn't take much to, to imagine just reading the narrative out of Mark. If God can do that with 12 ragamuffins, imagine what he could do for 70. So, what I would like to do today is I want us to just to take a moment and pray and ask the Lord, God, where can you use me? And maybe you're saying, oh, man, I don't have any wiggle room in my in my um, schedule. Maybe you need to ask the Lord, where can he free up your availability so he can use you? I think those are two questions that we need to ask. And I think what's going to happen is the Lord's going to lead you in those conversations. And, and he's going to lay, uh, lay different things on your heart. And then it, obedience isn't something that we say, God, help me be obedient. Obedience is just something you do. You can ask God to help you be obedient, give you strength and faith to be obedient. There's nothing wrong with that. But as the Lord lays things on your mind and on your heart, there's this responsibility to be obedient. And maybe maybe it's something you need to talk it out. You know, if you, want, if you need to talk, come, you know, this week say, this is what the Lord laid on my heart Sunday morning, and Pastor Ron, I just want to talk to you about this. Well, how can we move forward? Or I don't know what that looks like. But it's okay. I would love to have those conversations. Maybe you're here today, though. The, the, the first thing about availability to God isn't how to serve and how to make a difference. It's, I need to make my heart available for Him. Because I'm not serving him anymore. Or I've never had a relationship with him. Let me tell you, as we talk about making ourselves available, what God has made available for you. God has made eternity in relationship with God the Father available through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Because the reality is you cannot get to heaven on your own. Your best efforts on your best days are filthy rags before God. That's what our righteousness, our right standing with God looks like apart from Jesus Christ. And God knew that we can never get to heaven. God knew that we can never have a right relationship with him. So he stepped into humanity. And he said, you know what? I'm going to do what they can't do. I'm going to live a sinless life. And I'm going to die a death that they deserve so that I can so that I can restore relationship with humanity to God the Father. And the only way we can have that relationship is through putting our faith in Jesus. The Bible says if we believe in Jesus, that he's a son of God, that, that he died on the cross, and that he rose again, we are saved. That's all we have to do. We just have to believe and put faith on him. And if you, even if you never knew that that was available to you, because the reality is, what you earn on your own is eternal separation from God. So when you die, the reality is, we're not a body that has a soul. We're a soul that has a body. We're eternal beings. From the moment you were conceived, you are eternal. And your eternity is, is where you spend eternity after you die is based on whether you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And God wants it with you. He made it available because he wants one. But eternity away from Jesus is what we call hell. And God doesn't want anyone to perish in what we, what we say et eternal death. He wants all of us to have eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what we're going to do is we're going to stand Ben's going to lead us into a, a song, and, and I would love to introduce you. Nathan, could you be up here as well? And we'd love to introduce you to Jesus. Maybe you're here and you say, no, I just need to pray 
and ask God about my availability and where he wants me to be available. Then, man, treat your seat as your altar and go after Jesus, and he will speak. I promise you that. You'll hear that still, small voice. You'll hear this. You'll, you'll feel that nudging that Nathan was talking about, that, that oh, I, can't get a, I can't escape this thought. That's the Holy Spirit, and he will do that. But for the rest of us, we're going to go and celebrate Jesus. And sometimes God speaks to us while we're celebrating, while we're worshiping. But if you need Jesus as a just respond as Ben starts to sing. If you need to pray, treat your seat as your altar. But what I don't want us to do is to walk out of here the same way we walked in. I don't want us to walk out of here with the same things that we should bring to Jesus, that he's asking us to bring to him. Let's stand. Let's get after it.